Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Safe Prep Show. Tonight's guest, Tabitha from At the Betting Courts, part three of four of our interview with her. Thank you guys for being here. Be sure that you leave us a comment to let us know you're here. Be sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out the description for all sorts of links. Let's start the show. So making it social media acceptable, and we're mostly not on TikTok, so we can talk about it a little bit more than we used to, but and I know know your situation's a little different because of what your husband does. <clears throat> but uh for those females who are not against protection, but maybe don't know how to get into it or, or scared of it and that is their hiccup, what would what would you say about being able to defend yourself and also properly selecting the right one, also getting trained. What would you, they'll listen to you before they listen to me. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a domestic violence survivor. My first husband um, did a number on me. I know what it's like to have a gun held to my head. Um, and I was terrified of firearms. Now, if I can overcome my fear of firearms, anybody can. So with that said, once I learned how safe they are and how protected you could be if you had the right knowledge and the right information and somebody that was, see, here's the problem that men have. Uh, I do not recommend a husband teach a woman how to teach his wife how to shoot. And I do not recommend a husband buy their wife a firearm because they know what's best. I believe that a woman actually go and seek out some outs that she that she knows that has a selection or that she, that can take her to a store and can talk to her. Mostly men are very familiar with it. There are some women in, in Facebook YouTube that YouTube that really are proficient about it and they talk about it a lot. Go for it. Find them, watch their videos, watch watch people just shooting the videos, and they'll explain the new firearms as they're coming out. I had no clue. I was totally new to this, what, 17 years ago, um, and I wanted nothing to do with it, and I was terrified. I also had really horrible nightmares about what had happened to me, with very big key that we're going to get into. Like, I had horrible nightmares about what I had been through before. So now my husband takes me out and he teaches me all about the guns. I'm no longer scared of them. Uh, he teaches me to shoot. I am now very proficient in it. He teaches me um, safety on all aspects. And he, he studied how women learn. So he understands how I learn and what I, you know, he's, he's tailoring it all to me. I now, no, now no longer have nightmares. It is really interesting. Once I started being comfortable with it, and I started having it as, you know, on my side and I started, you know, it was daily part of me. I realized I woke up one day and I realized, you know, I haven't had a nightmare in months, months about being a victim. All of all of my nightmares have turned to dreams of me actually being proficient in stopping what was coming. Because, you know, we're still going to have the dreams. We've lived a life that nobody else has lived. Right. We're still going to have those dreams now. And now, instead of being the victim in all of my dreams. I'm actually the victor. So I highly recommend that a woman seeks out and goes to a gun store, talks and holds them all, feels them in her hand, and then picks the few that she wants and goes to a gun range that has a selection of them where she can pick them up, she can load them, she can fire them, she can talk to them and hire somebody if she has to, to take her out to test fire each one because you need to fire it before. Like I have, I have a friend that came over and we took a whole bunch of my favorites and she got to fire them. She realized that some of them have a kick that she, that she can't handle because she has hand issues. And she realized some of them were really too hard to conceal and some of them are very easy to conceal. So that to me is big. The, the knowledge before I had a girlfriend, that husband bought her a firearm and said, here, this is what's best for you. This is what's going to work. Okay. But when she went out to go test fire it, she couldn't even pull the trigger because it had, it was so, it was so hard. And then the kickback, once she did pull the trigger, she was so totally inaccurate that she, that she was like, I don't even want to touch it because I'm inaccurate with it. And it's hard. And the kickback hurt her shoulder to where she has shoulder pain. So men, 
they they mean well, but it's a very personal choice, and we we need to be the ones that make that choice. Now, here's where I am very adamant. My husband would always clean my gun for me, and one day I'm in the kitchen. I the deal was you clean my gun, and I'll clean the kitchen after dinner. Dinner. And one day I'm standing there cleaning the kitchen and I looked at my, my husband as he's cleaning the gun, my gun. And I said, can you put that down? I need to clean it. And he's like, well, this is our deal. And I'm like, no, no, it's not our deal. I need to be the one that takes the responsibility of every single aspect of that weapon. I need to be the one that does it. So I take it apart. I clean it. I put it back together. I'm the only one that ever touches it, that it's mine, period. But it's really... It's not scary. Seems like it seems like it's really scary, but it, it's not. One of the it's things just, I'm most highly... one of the things I'm most proud of in working with with some of the clients that I've 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 found on TikTok is those that were either afraid of it or against it. I was able to convince them that to do it and to also give them a little bit of guidance on how to get into it. Because if you're if you're just say you're a single lady. You don't have a spouse, you don't have a boyfriend, or if you're married and your, your husband is not into pupilly dues, finding a way into that and, and ending up in a good spot at the end it can be difficult. So uh, if you've got friends, uh, if you've got friends that are males that are, are into that, like I said, don't. I love your advice. I, I love it. Um, but if, if you're you're too scared to go to the gun store by yourself at least take one of your friends who you know is a big 2a person uh, just be mm -hmm. sure that you're the follow every piece of advice that tabitha just gave you because i i, I we mean we, we mean we, we mean well like you said but you need to you need to be the one making the decision we think totally differently and our body structure is made totally differently so what you can handle I may not be able to handle. And I also had carpal tunnel in both my hands. So some, some, some guns, when you're ratcheting it back, it's, it's hard. But, and for me, my body, I cannot put a double stack on me. I can't hide it anywhere, but a single stack I can hide on my body. And most women won't understand what that means. So find another woman that understands and that will go with you or that will teach you. Like my girlfriends have come here and I have multiple ways of carrying. We haven't even talked about that yet. And I'll bring a box down because when you look at how to carry your, I did a TikTok on that, um, on how to carry the concealed carry method. Somebody, I stitched it. Somebody had wanted to know, but it is very personal. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and women, we're not, we're not as easy as men. Men always wear pants or shorts. They always have a waistband, right? Women, we have dresses, we have shorts, we have skirts. We have to learn how to carry in all of those aspects for all of the different events that we go to. So for me, I have corsets, I have in the waistband, out of the waistband. I highly do not recommend in the waistband for your first um, holster at all. This is a topic I love, by the way. It's um, a good because topic because the one, if, if, if you're protection is in your purse and you have to have your purse with you and have get access it, it that's time carry <laughs> and I, here, I think there's also on. a huge what is the go ahead what is the first thing that somebody is going to take from a woman their purse absolutely what is the first thing that they put down when they have when they have to pick up their baby their purse what is the first thing that a baby goes through when they start rummaging in, in and around things, when you're looking or talking to somebody else, your purse? No, if, if I am carrying, it is on my body because they're going to have to get through me to get to my body to what I'm carrying. And I think it's also, Never it's also a safety Never in issue. A but, you know, if you've got, if you're around children, obviously that's all, that's a whole topic right there, you know, securing firearms. But, you know, if, if you set your purse down and there's a thing in it, and a kid gets into it. I would just rather eliminate that risk and have it on me mm -hmm. and be able to protect myself quickly. <laughs> and and right? I, I, I guarantee that I also tell people there's a huge difference between knowing how to be safe with a firearm and being proficient and putting yourself in situations. And there, luckily, there are a lot of 
of courses out there across the country at different farms places that are specifically mm -hmm. for females. Yep. Taught usually, usually taught by people that understand how the female thinks and the female me brain. Because if you can't get past that, that's what my husband is so amazing with because he understands that. And yeah. if you can't get past that, then you're, the women are going to struggle. And a lot of women have come to us and they're just asking us and, and we straight, straight up, you know, one, you have to choose your firearm that you and your body can handle. And two, you have to carry it in a way. I mean, you're going to spend, a, just put it out there. You're going to spend a lot of money on different ways of carrying until you find the one that you like. I, I still haven't found the one I like it. <laughs> you know, I hate to say it because he's always really busy, but Holster Pro on okay. the internet makes an amazing firearm um, holsters tailored to the gun that you're your specific gun. Um, we're still waiting. We ordered in August, and uh, we're still she waiting. She said firearm. For one Put of her ours, on the list, please. He, is, he makes amazing holsters, and it's leather. It just molds to your body. He he's he's amazing. Good quality work. I've had mine for probably four years maybe more and it's molded to my body and it just feels like a you don't even feel it anymore at all see i need something that's molded around my gut so i can apex carry that's what that's what i'm looking yeah. for i want to be able to sit down let it break in a rib <laughs> see this is why i don't in the waistband carry because when you when you carry in your waistband as a woman and i go to bend over to pick up a kid or something it slips up under my rib cage and then it like almost breaks a rib coming out oh that is the most painful thing in oh, the bet. world <laughs> so women are like i won't carry i won't carry and i look at them and i'm like yeah how did you carry and it's usually the in the waistband and i'm like yeah that's why try the out of the waistband uh, and just put a jacket over like i always have my cover shirt over with and my t-shirts are always hanging out you know it's trying to figure out how to dress and can still carry for a woman that is the hardest. And like Tabitha said, there are so many female creators on all of the social media platforms, specifically YouTube, um, that that is that is you need to find some that you enjoy watching and and learn from them because we're different. We're different. We are all different. But men, there are some really great videos of men that are going out there and they're looking at all the guns and they're taking them apart and they're talking about them and that's really free information that you can that a woman can watch and as she's watching all of these men reviewing the new guns that are coming out um you're watching them shoot them you're you're seeing between the differences of the recoil on each gun that they're shooting i mean you can gain a woman can gain a lot of information by watching men and their reviews and how they're set up and their stance and everything like that and then take that over to somebody that can teach you um how to shoot and that teach you which gun like you'd like the best it's all personal preference there is no right or wrong in in that topic at all it's personal preference i didn't think we'd get that deep into it i'm kind of happy we did that was <laughs> that's good stuff did you that's know a, that's a, when we have you back that might be a hope so <laughs> I wish they Did weren't you know so expensive. I, I, I wish they weren't so expensive. I'd have more. All the ways I can help. Let's talk about. Um, it kind of takes it back kind of full circle to kind of permaculture and uh, as we're preparing this topic, self-reliance. Um, like being able to water your garden, using nature to assist nature. Uh, uh -huh. And also um, when, uh, what you looked for when you bought your property. Um, oh, for those folks that uh, either are looking at getting a homestead when the housing market crashes or, you know, because uh, that, that'll be the time to get them, folks. But when you're looking at locations, what, what kind of things are beneficial to the kind of lifestyle we're talking about? 
So my water for water source and how to look at pro let's do property first. When we looked for property, we wanted some sort of water source on the property and we looked at the dirt. We wanted a good soil. Um, the excavator sold all of our topsoil to somebody up seven miles up the road. Um, I know them. They have amazing topsoil now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but um, I've had, I know, I've had to redo all of the topsoil. We bought the land for the soil and we bought it because it had a water source close to it and it had enough acreage that I could do something to it. It's a starter property. It is um, basically a hobby farm but it is far enough away from the main big city that and the smaller cities that are here. We live in what's actually technically considered a village because we only have like 1200 people here, probably 1500 people. In the summer it swells to 3000, but we're far enough away up in the mountains that people don't accidentally get to us. Like you can't accidentally, <laughs> like you have to be coming to us to get here. Um, so that's where we're far enough away, but we still are close enough to like my parents and stuff. The whole reason we chose this area was for my parents, but, um, we have, we're on the South side of the hill. So we have the South facing sun, which means I can grow way more stuff than the people on the other side of the mountain can, um, which is a benefit because we're growing. So what I personally would look for in a property, because we may be moving in when my husband retires, we'll probably be moving to a, another state. Um, and what I would be looking for is a water source. I would be looking at how the sun goes up and over the property, any kinds of trees, which can be removed, but trees and vegetation that would hinder a spot for gardening. Um, any buildings that I would want to be put and the shade and where they would wildlife that comes on the property. The county that I live in is famous for immense wildlife, like literally wildlife everywhere. Um, if, which can be a food source for you if you need to, I'd also be looking, I would not want to be into an HOA where somebody else would tell me what I can and can't grow and what I can and can't do on my property. Yeah, get live I, in an HOA if you want more government in your life. Right. So I don't want an, an HOA. Um, so I would be looking for something that doesn't have that restriction on it. Um, and I look, I look at all of the neighbors that were around me. So I, they probably thought I was really crazy because before we actually bought this property, we went and knocked on the doors and looked at how the neighbors kept their houses, how the neighbors were, um, met them, wanted to see how, what they were like, if they were nice or not. And if they you know, like accepted you in and invited you in for, for coffee or not. Um, but then the reason we bought this property basically was because it was one of the only ones that was available that had acreage at a reasonable price. And it met some of our aspects. It is on a hill. Um, so I have had to terrace sections of it. So many people like to tell me to garden a specific way or to raise my chickens a certain way. And I can't because I'm on a steep hill. So I can't yeah. do tractors and there's a lot of things I can't do. But you know me whenever I say can't. I always find a way of doing it like right so i have different paddocks i lock them in and out of certain areas um i build really tall fences i uh i'm, I, I'm getting really good at taking t posts out of the ground and i have a t post pounder so i can post pound those post holes back in but um there, there's interesting ways of making anything work you just need the land to do it and make sure they don't take your topsoil when they excavate so for the water source for us in Oregon, it is legal for us to catch water that's kind of building buildings. So I created on a, almost a building, the building that we have, except for our house, the cottage in the house, we have water collection systems that um, the 55 gallon barrels and the IBC totes. You can find a farmer that has extras, just make sure they don't have formaldehyde in them. Um, and we turned around and I created water collecting systems. And then we found a spring on the property. It's not an all year spring, but we found one and it, we, we diverted it from, it was where the driveway was. We diverted it under the driveway through a piping system. And then we put it down and we collect, we, I sunk a 55 gallon barrel into the ground and had kind of like a waterfall. I made my own waterfall system. And I take a water, 
bucket water can and I dip it in there and that's pretty much how I water the majority of my garden is with that spring that's right there and when it dries up I'll water from the actual rain barrels that we've got so when we lose electricity we lose our water source because we're on a well what I do is I take a five gallon bucket and I'll go out into the water collection systems and I'll grab some water you take the top off your toilet and you as you flush it drains the water and then you fill it back up um, because we're on a septic system it doesn't matter if we have water or not it's all and it's all gravity fed because we're on a hill and we took our septic out from up above here where it, the person had originally put it and it was never used and then we put it down below so it's gravity fed down there and so when we lose electricity and we have no water we literally can go out to our water sources that are outside grab a bucket fill it up bring it in flush the toilet and it still it goes out into the uh, septic system it's, it's a perfect system actually did you know that the I that the um, 55 gallon drum buckets the same plastic that's used for that is hot glue if you heat a 50 gallon barrel and barrel drum up like say you want to put a spigot in there. I know you're getting this look like what? And I'm like, mm, I did all the research. Like say you put the spigot in a little tiny leak around that spigot, spigot around your, around your connection. If you heat yeah. that connection up, you heat the barrel with a heat gun and then you take hot glue already heated and you squirt hot glue into it. It'll seal and mold as if it's made for that barrel. Really? Yeah. I've, I want to do we've got a asphalt roof and it's fairly new and i know in a disaster situation you're gonna drink some funky nasty water anyways but i'm i want to do the rain catchment system with gutters and and you can go to facebook marketplace y'all and find a farmer that has got some 55 gallon drums or some ibc totes now like she said these things do not need to have had chemicals stored in them it needs to be a, a food like i've got a food grade 55 gallon drum that that stored food grade syrup in it so yeah. it, it was a little sticky on top but it was already washed Perfect out bigger. i think i spent 10 or 15 dollars on it and you can you can go on just about any of the social media platforms and find somebody that can tell you how to do, do this at home with ten dollars worth of parts they make yep. kits that they send you everything they send you the spigot they send you the correct size things to tap into your gutters if that's what you're doing you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm a little worried about getting water off the roof. Um, we may, if something happened, we may use some kind of a tarp system or something in the backyard. But I still would like to have wa rain water catchment for the garden because uh, the weather seems to be getting weird and weird. <laughs> the weather is very weird. And if you if you've ever followed Elliot Coleman, he is a really great um, gardener up in Maine. Uh, he talks about the weather you need. It's, it's not just the seasons for growing, it's also the sun. And the sun, the sun and, the, and the seasons, if you don't have the sun, the sun is number one, if you don't have the sun cooperating with you, then you're gonna have a really hard time growing. And I have been noticing the sun and the seasons have been shifting for the last three, four years. Yep. And I keep saying it and everybody keeps telling me I'm crazy. I'm like, but you know, my journals, are, yeah, my journals are showing me that there is something going on and that um and i have to physically adjust my thinking and the way that i'm growing in order to get a good crop and i remember a while back on TikTok that was a trending topic and i i don't think i pay much attention to it but uh you know i've got these shades on both sides of the back patio that come down off the metal patio uh, that were there to keep the blinding morning and the blinding afternoon sun off of my patio where it was comfortable and I don't get any sun on my patio anymore because sun moved. <laughs> so, you know, like you said, the sun matters. It, it does matter a lot. Yeah. You, uh, so you do a lot of homesteading and, and gardening. Uh, talk a little bit about the master, the master gardening program that you Oh, mentioned. that's an amazing system. So what is a master gardener? A master gardener is somebody that has been trained by the extension office in your county. Most all local counties have an, an extension office. And what, what those were brought into play during World War II when 
people were hungry and they wanted they wanted to learn how to garden and everybody wanted to put a garden in so they were all going to the professors in these in the architectural not architectural in the um agricultural industry so all of these professors that were teaching this information were being bombarded with women that wanted to learn how to garden because their men are off at war and they need to know how to do this so they put together a program called the master gardening program and it's really inexpensive to go through if you volunteer so many hours in me it was like 140 dollars if i volunteered like 120 hours or something if i didn't want to volunteer i could pay 240 dollars to go through the program it gives you a huge huge book and all of the topics are written by professors um, that are teaching this in the universities. And then on top of that, all of your courses that you go through, you have leaders in the industry that are coming in in the university and they're teaching you. So you go out and teach other people. So the whole aspect of it, the whole concept of bringing it, of, of making this program back in the 40s and 50s when they started this whole thing, the whole concept was they wanted to teach a few people so those people would go out and teach the masses and let the professors have their time to teach the students at the university and to do their research. So you literally sit down there and you're being taught everything that they know. You're, you're going through botany classes, you're going through propagation and everything. It's is perfect for my type of brain because I'm getting all of this information. You have workshops where you have to look at a branch and you have to figure out how many years old that branch is, you know, by, by looking at its growth, growth veins that it has on there. Or you have to, they bring in sprigs from all over the county and you have to identify it just by a few leaves. And uh, it's actually, I highly recommend it for anybody that wants to get into gardening because gardening has so many different aspects that it gives you a really heads up on what to do. Now, they do have online classes. Um, the same program can be taught online, but I think it's a disservice to do it online because the hands-on part of it was like amazing. Like even for the bugs class, for the, when we were doing the whole bugs, like what's a true bug, what's not, what's a pest, what isn't, like what's beneficial, what is, what isn't, um, what kind of, uh, what kind of chemical would you use and how do you use the chemicals and why do you use the chemicals in a certain way? Like some chemicals I would always stay away from and then I learned, oh, they're not really bad if you use them the specific way. Um, why, like why we stay away from some chemicals, you learn all of that. But you're like literally, when you're doing the bug section, you have these little magnifying glass and you're looking through and you're like literally looking through these bugs um, and determining them which one is good and which one isn't. And sometimes you, you really, you think a certain bug is bad, but it's really a good bug. So, so one of my favorite parts of this podcast is is finding uh finding the segues so your agricultural extension office for your county and like she said most counties have them uh is also the place where you can get your uh pressure canner checked you do some yes. canning don't don't you do some canning mm -hmm. tabitha i do and <laughs> I, I just just a little just slightly a little um however do you know you don't have to get every pressure canner checked? Explain. <laughs> Your all-American pressure canners should not be checked. Your all-American pressure canners have the gauge and the weight. So your weight jiggles at 10 pounds and your pressure, so you have this weight on the side and it says 5, 10, or 15 pounds and you put it on for your, for your al altitude that you are. So I actually called, because that's another like thing. I'm ADHD and CDO, which is OCD, but it has to be CDO because the letters have to be in order. So I, so I call companies and I ask them, <laughs> I ask them questions um, like mayonnaise, Best Foods Mayonnaise told me that their mayonnaise never goes, it never, is, never expires. The best by date is the best by date. And after that date, it'll get a little lemony, but as long as it's not open and exposed to the air and it's stored properly, it doesn't expire. That's a really good thing to know as a prepper. 
I also love mayonnaise. With your <laughs> I do. Right? Right? Also with your Frank's hot sauce. That's really good to know that it never expires and you don't have to refrigerate. So I make the phone calls. Like if it doesn't say, if it says refrigerate or whatever, it's certain bias or I'll call them and say, how far past the date can I, can I eat this? Well, I called All American and I asked them because I took, I, I, I was told you have to take your pressure canner in. I follow the rules or I used to um, every year and get it, get it calibrated. That's for the Presto canners. All American told me, no, your gauge, because my gauge was three degrees, three degrees off. My gauge is three degrees off. And they told me because I took it in and they couldn't figure out how to calibrate it. They're like, we can't even test this thing. And yeah. I'm like, well, that's interesting. So they told me you need to contact the company and you need to get a whole new gauge because this is wrong. So I contacted the company and I'm like, well, apparently my pressure canner that I bought two years ago is bad. And she said, no, what's going on? And I explained the, the gauge is, doesn't start jiggling until 13. She goes, well, the weight is what you need to go by. You don't ever have to replace your gauge unless it's off and you want it replaced. She goes, that 10 pounds of pressure, when you put it on that little spout that the steam is coming out of, that's what you're using as your guide. You're using how many times the, the air spits out of there as your guide. The, the gauge is just used to show you how far past it and how, you know, how much. She goes, that's just referencing. She goes, but you're And for those of you who higher. don't know a lot about canners, like Presto's a little cheaper than All American. All American, well, All American is built to be handed down generation to generation. And if you find an old one, like I'll collect those things. But if you find an old one somebody doesn't want anymore, take that puppy. You can totally rehab the whole entire thing. They sell all the parts online. If something breaks, you can grab a whole new part. It, they're, they're amazing. But um, for canning, you don't have to take those in. So now let's up down scenario, down scenario because I always look at, okay, the worst case scenario. If I can yep. never get any parts at all, Prestos have a rubber that goes on the, that goes on the inside of the lid. You have to replace that rubber ring it's the gasket every so often all american canners don't have a rubber gasket they have a metal finely tuned metal ring and it's metal to metal that tops down i put a little bit of olive oil around that every few times that i can and that's all i ever need to do for a great seal um, on top if a drop down scenario happens and i don't have electricity and i don't have gas or anything left that i can use as a source I can turn around and take either my rocket stove or just a flame and a fire over it. And I can put my pressure canner on top of a wood burning fire and I can can all of my items there. I just have to remember to keep my pressure consistent. And I would assume that the dial would benefit you in that situation. Well, the, the, the pressure, the gauge would benefit me there because I would be able to see how far Cause you're going to have to adjust. Down. Cause you're going to have to adjust the flame and distance and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. But as long and, as and I that's a as really, long as, as far as canning goes, guys, that's a really good scenario to put yourself in. You know, if you like, I enjoy eating pickles, any kind of pickled anything I love. So we were thinking ahead. We're like, we probably need to stock up on pickling things in case we have mm -hmm. to pickle after we can't buy the pickle things anymore. And if you want to be able to, be self-sufficient and have a garden and be able to preserve things out of your garden post big disaster you need to you need to be able to can and preserve things so that's why i love preparedness because it's so right like that when did you it's start canning? Holes everywhere when did you start uh, probably 30 40 years ago 30 years ago you got me beat by about years <laughs> we, I mean, we started two summers ago we started canning two summers ago oh it's so fun i started i started canning about 30 years ago my my mother canned my grandmother canned um i come from a long line of like we lived on a on my backyard that i lived in with my parents we were we were always poor we never went without because my parents always had a garden yeah. So when we moved into a property, we would turn the whole backyard into a garden. And I was always in charge of something. So as a kid, I got to plant lettuce. I was so mad that my cat went poop in my lettuce bed right after I had seeded it. 
but the lettuce grew. It just didn't grow in a straight line, <laughs> but it still grew and we ate it. My dad is an engineer and he engineered a food dryer. He built a food dryer um, to where we would dehydrate our own food in the backyard. We, we were the weird hippie people. I grew up in the back of a Volkswagen bus and my mom had a bug. So like nice. literally, oh, it was, you know, it was really embarrassing having homemade bread when you went to school because it would always fall apart back then. But now that I'm older and I made my bread, uh, and remind me to tell you about the bread machine because I can get every man to, to tell, a, to, to say yes to an expensive bread machine for their wives. But um, now that I'm looking back at things, I'm so glad I grew up the way I did because I, I'm taking all of that stuff that I watched my parents do with the internet and I'm figuring out how to do it and do it even better. My mom called me the other day and she goes, you know, I used to grind wheat when you were little. And I'm like, I know, I know. And the interesting thing about grinding the wheat is that when I was little and I was eating the bread, I didn't have any intolerance to flour or anything. Like my yeah. gut was so healthy, right? So healthy. And then there were years when we stopped grinding, I was thinking back, that's when I slowly, very, very slowly started having intolerances to bread products. But when we started grinding again, that was when my gut started healing again, because gotcha. I'm getting all of the vitamins directly from the wheat, just before I put it in the bread is when I'm grinding it. And it's so healthy for you. Okay, I gotta talk about bread machines. Whether or not I'm gonna talk, not, I'm gonna talk about what, bread what, machines. Wait, 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 don't can it yet. Give me a minute. <laughs> what is your favorite thing to can? What's your eat that you've canned? What's my what? Fa most favorite thing to eat that you've canned? Right now, it's the dry canned potatoes, which is okay. uh, a rebel form of canning that has now been tested. And I did it. My husband and I both, every morning we're having it for breakfast. It is absolutely the most amazing, delicious thing that you could ever think of eating. It, you're taking the potatoes and you're cutting them up. You can't get me started on this stuff. I'll just go crazy. And you're, you're, you're soaking them and you're getting all the starch out of them. And then you push them, you dry them all off and you put them in, a, in the jar and you pack them all in and they're raw right? And you're packing them all in and then you're putting the lid on them and you're putting them in the canner. There's no water, nothing. You're just sticking them in the canner and you're pressure canning them. And then they, they get out, you'll wash the jars and everything. People always ask me why I wash my jars because I'm long-term storing it, right? Long-term yeah. storing it. So I wash all the jars. I make sure the seals are good because if the seals come off while you're washing them, then you know you don't have a good seal. And yeah. I put them, I, I store them. And then the best thing about that is we are literally take opening up a jar and dumping it in the skillet and browning the potatoes right then and there. It is the I'm best on, hash brown and, and French fries. So I think we'll probably try the French fries tonight. So I, cause I've just, I'm just new to this part of it. So we had 20 pounds of potatoes and I did three of them cut in French fry shapes. And I'm going to put them in my rotisserie basket in my, um, air fryer and see how they crisp up. I'll do a video if we do it. it it's it just they're so we'll good. That. Yep, I don't I, do. Anything. I actually bought I actually bought the canner and I, the first thing I can was ground beef, and then I think what I did it. Uh, just a presto. Probably was at the time. It's a perfect it was, starter I, canner. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, she does. She'll do regular USDA and then she'll do Rebel too. We we've done both and can everything we're not supposed to you know uh I, we like the, the weird stuff i like meat because i think that's awesome to add to rice and beans and long-term dry good stuff and then uh -huh. uh, uh jellies and cakes and syrup milk butter it's fun and and it's amazing it we started we started this two summers ago and it's just um, even if you don't do it like every day even if you don't do it every week you consistently put stuff back and well, a lot of it's way, if, you, if you can once a week and you can seven meals once a week after seven weeks af after the seven day seven weeks you'll have 49 meals that could literally take you through a month and a half and say you have to leave like there's a fire and you're you have to flee your home because of a disaster that's coming what are you going to do 
I can tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab all of my important paperwork and then I'm going to grab the cases of food and make, and we have a can opener in the car and we will definitely be able to survive on the cases of food that we have because I've already prepped them in meals. So you asked me what I like canning. I can complete meals like chicken pot pie. I pop that lid open. I stick it in. I put some homemade pie crust on the top of it. I bake that at 350 for 30 minutes and I've got chicken pot pie for dinner and it's not we'll from do. a store. We'll do leftovers. Well, you know, if she's got a leftover like. stew or soup or something, I mean, we'll do the leftovers. Yeah. It's yeah. it's fun it's and good. quite addicting. It and it's just good eating, right? Right. We can't. My, my wife's. I guess one of the best. We can't keep it on the shelf. Is the uh, uh, cinnamon apples? The cinnamon apples are really good. Uh, cowboy candy. That's good. But we've had the chicken, we've had we've had the ground beef, we've used it in meals. Yep. It Do you season so, yours? The ground beef? Before you the can chicken. It, do you season your meat? In, in your I don't think uh, uh we may be putting a little bit of salt in. Mm -hmm. But I think that's it. Yeah. I think that's all. I was I did a whole season of canning one year where I, I seasoned all the meat and lemon pepper for the chicken and chipotle for, you know, stuff. And I found that when I came back, because some people like really season their stuff. And I found that when I went to go use that stuff that was heavily seasoned, like to go pick, to go pick one up, I'm like, well, all I have left is lemon pepper because we eat chipotle the, mo the majority of the time. Yeah. And I'm like, I really don't want to use it for, for anything. So I don't season any of my meat except for with a little bit of salt. And then I can it all up plain and I season it afterwards. And pressure canning changes some of the seasonings. It either makes it really potent or it diminishes the potency. Gotcha. And I tell people too, it's it's a good hobby and you can put back a lot of food, a lot of really good food, a lot of nutritious food. Mm -hmm. You don't even necessarily have to have a garden to start canning and preserving things. You can you can no. buy things at the store and preserve them and make them delicious. Uh, and it is not, you can make it expensive to get it into if you want to start off with some expensive gear. But you can get you a Presto. You can get you a, mm -hmm. a, a, a canning book and start following some recipes. You can get you a case or two of jars and not and not drop $1,000 and just start this gradually. And uh, there's, a, there's a ton of great canning creators. You're one of them. That's a lot of your content. And there's a bunch of others on all the social media accounts. But it's, it's just good food. Yeah. So I highly recommend if you if anybody wants to get started canning, I highly recommend a water bath canner and get the big one. I think it's 21 quarts. I'm not quite sure what the size is, but get the big one and then a few of the basic tools. I go I go over all of that in some of the videos, just a few of the basic tools. And then you've got everything to start canning like tomate, tomatoes. Um, you can't do vegetables. Well, you can. The, the Rebel Canning does the vegetables, but I don't recommend that just for my safety. Um, and then you learn the rules, get yourself a ball blue book that mm -hmm. pretty much has everything in it. Or you can just go to the internet and the USDA has all of the recipes. There's one site that has all these recipes on there that are USDA approved because you want to start learning the acidic acidity level towards the fruits and the vegetables that you're canning. Like you can't can vegetables, but you can if you pickle them. That's because you're adding the vinegar that increases the acidic level. I'll it's explain the importance you know. of doing a little bit of research before. Let me tell you my canning story. It was, it's so depressing and sad. Uh, I think it was the sec second. I think second year we had a garden, so we were gonna. I was gonna can some stuff, right? But we didn't have a pressure canner yet. We just had a water bath canner. So I'm like all excited, and I've got all my vegetables piled up, my water bath canner, and we got our jars and stuff. And I'm like, I better, I better do a little research before I start doing it. And it's like a city levels. I was like, I can't can none of this. I can't water. I was so depressed. And then I, I think <laughs> right? six months later, I went out and actually bought a pressure canner because you can can more yep. yeah. safely. And the your Presto kitchen, and the your perfect. rules, and I'm pretty sure Tabitha agrees. Right. She's going to do things one way in her kitchen, and that that's what we do. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do... I'm going to do things differently in my kitchen, um, but when I video something, I'm going to make sure that I am sharing 
as close to USDA as possible, just because I don't want that liability of somebody making a mistake and thinking they heard me one way and heard me differently. Um, I don't want to be responsible in this illnesses. Absolutely. And uh, I think most of my most of the people watching this probably understand USDA stuff that's tested. And then that's a whole nother side of canon, right? It's a whole nother side of canon. But my wife's done some stuff, but like I said, we do both. Um, and we feel comfortable. Of course, like the Amish. Uh, exactly. The Amish water bath. Yeah, they water bath canned vegetables. I talked to a lady on the train when I was on vacation and I asked her, I said, do you water bath meats? And she goes, yes. I said, for how many minutes? And she says, three hours. So she's having to sit there for three hours and making sure that water doesn't get below an inch of the top of the jars. It yep. has to be above, one inch, one inch to two inches above. So she's literally constantly putting boiling water from a, a pot on the stove into the boiling water bath canner because you can't let the boil stop. The hard boil yeah. has to be consistent. So for that, I mean, if somebody wants to take that on, they can, but I would rather just put it in a pressure canner and pressure can, and it saves me so much more time. Oh, absolutely. Um, and and she was, guys, she was talking about, there isn't, when you, you start putting your face out and start doing content on social media, there's always a little bit of a risk that somebody's gonna come after you somehow. So we would just rather, yep. you know, do it the right way. Blackbeard Firestarter packs small so you can take it on your plunders. The best kindling for any situation, wet or dry. One rope can light more than 50 fires. Click the link if you dare and get the best fire starter around.